first of all, this has been a great week. Um, I've learned a ton from uh, all of you. It's been really interesting to hear about all your work and uh, had a lot of great conversations. My main focus has been on creative independents uh, who are navigating the creative economy in Austin. And one of those uh, people is this uh, artist named Beth Concetta Rubel. One of the things that has been really, really difficult for Beth um, as a woman of color and as a person uh, with a queer identity is finding a home in Austin. Uh, she has a very, very provocative brand of art, sort of a representation uh, that she came up with. Um, her art's been taken down in Austin multiple times at spaces she's put it up in. She's relied on social media, both Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, to build an audience around the country. And so what has happened is, is that she has no home in Austin, but she does have commissioned art uh, she does in other parts of the country. And, and so these free tools, these open tools, have become very, very important to her, uh, her business, her brand, her practice. Where my future research, and this is what's helped this week, has really, uh, uh, is into is, you know, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality stories. So one thing I've been kicking around for the last uh, about six, seven weeks is this idea of, well, Beth's reality in Austin is not the reality that a lot of people see. You know, her uh, experiences in creative spaces when she's pitching to potential funders, when she's trying to get a gallery show is very different than um, what a young white male might experience. So one of the ideas um, that I really want to pursue over the next uh, few months is creating an experience by which when you put on a virtual reality headset is that you can see what she sees. You can experience uh, what with, with she experiences. Her narrative is something that is often not written about, is often not um, uh, explored in the, in the media, and that's why she does make this art, because she feels uh, unheard or, or misunderstood. So what, what I want to do with virtual reality uh, storytelling is give folks like her the opportunity to show people what it's like to be her. So uh, that's what this week has kind of inspired. And uh, yeah, thank you. Really full of questions. And the main one for me, uh, which I personally relate to, it's the diversity of ethos behind the open, in the open. My particular research that I'm starting with, I'm trying to deal with how to engage people more in this particular sort of surveillance part is related to a specific study case that is breast cancer and follow up and actually uh, even in a more narrow field that is related with uh, assessing, assessing the function of the arm. I got the opportunity to get to learn and to listen to different perspectives. I remember, I remember in terms the talk about theater and the project that I didn't know about and the, the possibility that we are having now probably bringing some data set to the field of computer vision and starting the collaboration. Also, for instance, in my uh, project, I would also uh, like to explore different uh, approaches to uh, serious games in this problem of engaging people in this particular treatment. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Shadow for this opportunity because, well, I'm not part of the program, but really it was very, very, very inspiring for me. Yesterday we were talking about uh, machine learning with Gustavo. Then I was, I was very excited about that idea, so I, was, I, I went back home and I was just looking for these kind of things. And my question is, um, does some, somebody know uh, of any projects or any work being done in this area, but related to open software as well? Semantic coding? Yeah, but not just sentiment analysis, but yeah. going deeper. Like, uh, I mean, I'm also, I'm also interested in yeah, sentiment analysis, if this is positive, negative, or neutral, but we should like go, uh, we should go deeper uh, and analyze it, all of the content. So yeah, I'm like, kind of like, this is the question I have. Drew in my, in my head during this week, this idea that um, we all kind of struggle with, when we are considering this, this topic of openness, we're all kind of struggling with the, how to engage people with, with open ideas, open technology, open content. And I think this, this problem is something that is worth thinking about and probably researching a bit, a bit more. Yeah, so thank you all. Uh,
I was talking to colleagues of ours last night, and there's a, a really powerful idea that I think about oftentimes in the last few years, which is we never know how much we touch someone else in a remote way, and that can happen in the most unexpected places and in the most unexpected ways. And uh, I, I think that we go home and we must have touched people in many ways in small conversations outside or in our talks. So when I came here, I came here mainly because of maps, mapping, mm -hmm. open source uh, mapping. That's probably the major part of my work. And I'm taking so much more from me. Uh, from me, from here. <laughs> I take a lot from me. <laughs> I know some people. Well, I know Gustavo, and uh, I know Pedro very well since a long time ago. I crossed my paths with Catherine. I know her work as well. They still managed to impress me all the time, and I was impressed with everything I, I saw here. Mainly, I create prototypes, and then I try to get a team. Another thing I do is uh, animation, computer, an computer animation, usually real-time animation. Uh, I need assets, and uh, I also found out what can, I, I didn't really find out. I know there are different licenses, and I think I understood a bit more about licensing uh, for open, and what is actually open, what is not. For my research, um, I do a lot of research with elevation and ge elevation and geometry based localization. So I need to know what the world looks like, what 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 you, the world's geometry actually is. Um, GeoStream by Joan Decor is a colleague of mine, a colleague, a colleague and a friend, um, created this amazing uh, what will I call it framework for Unity, which uses Google Altimetry, Bing Altimetry. Google Geocoding API, etc., etc., etc. It's amazing for research. We need an area, do something in an area, anywhere in the world, and we get altimetry that uh, we uh, can extrude buildings, bridges, etc. We did a lot of work on that. The thing is that we can do that for research, but we've been discussing uh, coming out, coming up with some uh, commercial maybe applications for my thesis. Uh, it's coming late for my dissertation, but for further work from that, I got really amazed with Carpool DB. I think it's going to be really easy because my thesis is about disaster management by applying a real-time strategy game principles to it. Um, and Carpool DB, from what I saw, I didn't have enough time to explore it yet, but I will, and I will have a deep look at it because I can get very quickly get really versatile data sets that can help the um, civil forces, the protection forces like the firemen, the police, etc. Thank you, everybody. So, hi guys. I prepared a very quick uh, presentation. When I signed up, it was for me a huge challenge because uh, concerning open data, I was um, very um, a virgin, as you can say. Uh, because I had a very hard time to understand some of the concepts. So the information that I have here was a bit my eye-opening and the three uh, biggest uh, maybe lessons, uh, maybe information exchange that I obtained from this week. This actually happened. We didn't sit down to smoke, but this mm -hmm. was my encounter with um, the open sorcerer. So I was with <laughs> Katarina. Um, outside, and she said, "Let's go for a smoke." So we I went offer you one, in my defense. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't sit like this, but this is how it felt. And she tells me, "Well, because I thought hacking was computers, and you know." And she tells me all the story, and she looks at me, and she's like, "Well, hacking is, you know, a way of life." And I'm like, "What do you mean?" And you know, this was my first wow moment. My second moment was out and about, just to absorb the culture. And uh, we were beer break. Why do I have we were beer break? Because I was not on the beer break group. So, <laughs> yes, I realized this on my third lesson, which is all about people. All about people, about the margaritas, and about the beer. When I say it's all about the people, when we sat down for coffee, 
uh, all our discussions were about the open data, were about the workshops. And, you know, sometimes I didn't agree because I was so far out and people were explaining me and they're like, no, listen, this is the way we think, this is the way it is. And I'm like, oh, this is a huge different perspective on the way I actually saw and understood open data. Okay, let's do something together and let's actually think about um, different concepts and how we can, uh, in my case, of obviously, to be female entrepreneurship, but how we can apply it and how we can mesh um, all these different areas. So thank you. Um, and I, I won't repeat myself, but for me, it's all about the people. So thank you so much for sharing um, all these moments. When I was talking with you, I, I immediately started seeing bridges that could be made. Um, of course, I'm, more, I'm in a situation that might be a little bit different because uh, I finished my thesis and now I'm looking for a new direction. And uh, this institute also allowed me that, allowed me to think about the work that I had done and what I can do. And thinking about open data, I came here because two, two or three years ago I started getting in contact with the do-it-yourself mentality, the makers community, and there was a... I had this idea of what it's open and to come here to see different uh, connotations to the word open. It's interesting. The last presentation is a clear case of that, to have an open mic, see how this is open. Um, and for me, on the open data side, I was immediately thinking about also my background in environmental engineering and how you could use uh, open data, open environmental engineering, like in some context of environmental complex, environmental issues. Uh, Immediately, I also start to think about specific diseases that were here or topics like storytelling, massive gaming, uh, or serious gaming uh, in environmental context. Uh, so it was interesting to have all these uh, these ideas, and also more or less two months ago, I was in a different workshop about open science, and it was also interesting to make this kind of context, context about open data and open science, how they can be connected. And also, in the sense that uh, we have all these databases, open database, and coming back to the work, to my previous work about quality insurance, uh, thinking about who specific questions about uh, the quality of the data that is available. And uh, I mean, if you are using this data, uh, in your research, who is responsible for the quality of it? It was well. I'm. I had. I mean, you can see I still have to think about much of these issues, but it was really helpful to to raise all these questions. So this is one of the most uh, takeaways from here. Takeaways from here. So thank you. It was very refreshing to get together with all of you because I have been here in Austin for a long time. And uh, usually I go to Portugal just um, over winter and I don't have opportunity to get together with my colleagues and was very like was very was like a bridge like of Austin with Portugal because I have been very involved in the community here in Austin uh, with the culture and also with Portugal and it was great to understand that actually there is research on my topic in Portugal. It's something I, think I was not aware. Uh, so it was really eye-opening for me to understand that uh, there are people doing research, really good research on my topic in Portugal. It's a, it's a relief, actually. I feel really glad to, to, to have learned that. And uh, in terms of takeaways from my research, I, I think um, I think that it's very challenging to, it's like well, what Jacqueline said, like the idea of open data when I was looking at the program and I was thinking, okay, this is, it's missing just the day, like open relationships because <laughs> it was open something every day. So it's like the idea of um, conveying openings, openings, it's very, it's very challenging because people usually have um, trouble to understand the idea of being open, uh, sharing, um, and that, that's what I took from all the talks, 
uh, that I um, heard, the idea of uh, cultural democracy, I think it's, it's the, the concept that ties all the presentations together, the idea of being open. And, uh, and this is really related to what I have done for the last years and to what I want to pursue in my career as a research, like to, to, to work with the, the community, with the local community, whatever I, I am, if it's here in the United States or in Europe, in South America, whatever, I want to take these values with me of engagement, um, being open, and so the, all the things I heard here during this week was like a reinforcement of my um, my values as a researcher and also as a pacifist. So it's really, really, <coughs> how can I say that? I feel connected. When I went to the ATX space yesterday, I, I had like the quick, <laughs> that I think this open openness is, I'm seeing now as like an open door um, from the virtual to the material world. I, that's something that I've been thinking the last years about information, all of these shifts to the digital, communicate, digital journalism, and I do believe that um, information is stronger if it's both on digital and traditional media. And when we went to the, to the ATX space, I saw the same idea, but not about information, but about stuff. You know, we program on the computer, and then we see the material result of that. Maybe we can like keep in mind that it's a space for us to share resources, like what uh, Hugo told, that he just found out some images that he, he can use in his work. Yesterday, I, I, I saw a um, news article about these, the hugest uh, archive on sounds of the nature was just released. So for those who work with sound studies, it's a really interesting resource. So if we, we, we should keep in mind, like, like when we see something interesting, share that there, because they are resources that could be really useful for our research. And the last thing I promise, please open up your pictures. I got here with a lot of questions. I don't have all the answers, but now I'm, I, I feel like I have some guidance. Uh, I, I live here with some more guidance that I arrived. So it was uh, it was really interesting and thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you very much, everybody. So, as some of you know, I am designing and developing a mood mapping, mood motion tracking application, um, which well, basically people you know what mood tracking is, right? I think most of you know. So um, I want to do that, and while people are uh, tracking their emotions, data from facial expression and wearables, digital data will be gathered, and hopefully with that data, I will be able to advance the field of effective computing, which basically uh, intends to build systems that can recognize, express, and cap emotions. And I'm using Ruby on Rails, which is, which is an open source web framework, and luckily for me, Rubyists, they have a strong commitment mm -hmm. to open source. They share all the code for me to use and reuse, and then I'll, it will take me less, less time. I will show you, for instance, for um, facial expression recognition, I will probably use this application, <laughs> which... <laughs> <doesn't>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, um, so far it only has four, Emotions, but you can you can do whatever you want. I can add more later, and this is for free. Okay, now I'll talk a little bit just about the interface of my application. Then you paint over it with uh, the color that represents an emotion. For instance, anger could be the could be red. And you paint over the photograph with red, and then I'll separate the photo and the paint. And then with uh, when I have enough uh, sprinkles of paint, I'll make an em uh, emotional painting. That, that shows uh, our emotional expression. Using the painting analogy, isn't it? Is it so obvious? Why, why I should do a, maybe a, a real painting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't look into it, but I will for sure talk with Katarina uh, to see if I can maybe do a real painting. Well, I just wanted to finish by thanking again Sharon, Gustavo, Karen for putting this together and 
I'd like to say that I love you with all of you. I hope we keep in touch. Maps are going to be awesome. Thank you for sharing, you know, your ideas and you know fears and, and you know suggestions for how to get people more interested in hardware and. Thank you for teaching me about open data. I'm going to bug you a lot. And um, I mean, it, it's so great. To <laughs> no, this is really a retreat, a treat and a retreat. So, very grateful. Thank you all. may know I'm a research and interactive documentary um, along with the National Film Board of Canada. This is the website from the National Film Board of Canada, the interactive part. Yeah. Also, yeah. Before this connection of memory is lost. Keep this in mind that uh, they are uh, still looking for survivors for uh, personal stories. This project is not about individual war stories, and it's not about survivors. We're going to tally up the tens of millions of people whose lives were cut short by the war, and see how these numbers stack up to other wars in history, including trends in recent conflicts. counting soldiers and civilians separately. Each of these figures represents 1,000 people who died. Civilians were of all walks of life. Whereas military deaths were almost entirely men, the average age was about 23. These open data allow the producer to really uh, give us an idea of what Happen. During the experience, we can dig and add more information because audiences are all different, and some people just want to hear real stories, survival stories, and other people want the numbers so we can give them in interactive documentary. And this is one of the ideas that I'm working with the National Film Board of Canada. Users are creating uh, a lot of content that uh, is uh, through collaborative strategies in some of the documentaries. And uh, this is something that I want to think and uh, this concept uh, because uh, I, I, I think it raises a lot of issues that I want to, to think about uh, when uh, we have all this material, all these videos, if they are or not open source. My head now is like a popcorn in a microwave, like a lot of ideas. <laughs> and one of the ideas was like, I was in newsroom in 2009 and I'm um, 2012. And in my, my hometown, Fortaleza, we have a new record of, uh, with home size. It was 1,629. And all the newspaper, with mine, we put just the headline, a new record, and that. And uh, inside the news was just texts. Just text. So, and then we, go, we put this news on Facebook and Twitter. So, why you click? I think now, more than ever, uh, the journalists and programmers have to be best friends. Because like, sometimes journalists have the idea, but they don't know how to do it. Like Chip talked about this in the election, and he said that the newspaper wasn't interested in that. And I don't know why, because if I was in a newsroom here, I put this in all the news about the election. Because this enraged the, the news. I'm working with data visualization, and unfortunately, most of the data visualization is not like that. Here we have a story, and then after you go like one, two, three steps, you can play with the data. So you can like grab the, the, the states and put it on side or on the other side, and this is very nice, and it is engaging. So the people will, this is good, so the people will come back, will share, will like say, I like this. Most of the newspapers are looking to data visualization like the holy grail. So, so they are doing, just doing, just putting the data and make visualization, but they are not good. Because for me, journalism is about telling stories. So this is very important because I think the data visualization should be open. Everybody should play with the, like he's playing there. Okay. So this is it. Thank you very much. I said before, we are on, when we you are walking down the street to see the bats, off of the way was talking about this kind of presentation. Yesterday at the meeting we talked a lot about the, when we went to the civic hall and discussing about all these ideas after the meeting. So that's an important feedback. Actually, 
when I was outside, I, I met Caterina, Pedro, I worked with Monica, so actually I, I found that uh, it was actually really, really nice. I, I felt very, very close to the work that you do. And it's so diverse and, and so, um, in a way, interconnected. That, um, I really hope we, we had many conversations, many questions, and I, I really hope that we can keep up uh, what we've been saying. Of, obviously, uh, yeah, we only have 24 hours. <laughs> but uh, I would like to really follow up, and also, if possible, with the Institute with this concept of, of openness. I was uh, not new to it, but a little bit far from it. I was scared of it because it involves software, hardware, things that I've always sort of uh, a little bit uh, scared. But it, it made it very uh, digestible and interesting and sort of usable this week. So, uh, um, and actually, I really appreciate uh, your connection with visualizations and stories. Stories are a way to visualize data, and there's so much data here, open data. Maybe we will continue to, to talk about this and with, with many of you. So, uh, and I hope also with Sharon, we we'll we'll think about continuing this. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, everybody. everybody thank you. Well, it was really great for me personally to be here and hear from all of you um, this week. And I hope that some of you will go into this proposal or to new proposals that we will have in the future. Uh, besides Plunk, I always, I always hesitate saying Plunk or Plank, but it's Plunk. <laughs> <laughs> it's the sound of a, a stone being dropped to the water. Uh, and it's Plunk, of course. Um, there's a, the other festival, Future Place in Port, and we'll have another doctoral consortium. And if you want to suggest uh, ways where we can improve that doctoral consortium as well, please, please feel free. We have been doing it like with presentations. But if you have other ideas for um, for doctoral consortium that will take in October in Port, please um, you can email to me or someone else that's been involved. As we want to make it different and try to improve as much as possible and connect people in that event as well. Uh, so I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much.